Okay, today what we want to begin to talk about is uh, what in Chen is called Chapter 4, which is called uh, Waves in Plasmas. And uh, the basic idea is that uh, a plasma is a very jiggly medium we're going to talk about, it's going to be ba basically very uh, uh, responsive to waves. And so when I make a, when I do something to the plasma, the basic thing is it's going to jiggle more or less with waves. But before we start into uh, talking in detail about waves and, and so forth, um, what I'd like to do is begin our discussion by talking about the subject of just basically uh, oscillations, and in particular, not so much oscillations as uh, uh, Fourier um, what do you call it? Fourier analysis of periodic motions. So the idea is that let's consider something which in space and time has oscillatory behavior. Uh, so let's consider anything, you know, fluid, plasma, uh, so forth. Um, that has periodic motions or oscillating components in both space and time. Now, what we would kind of do is we would like to then decompose that not into a function regularly of x and t, but rather into something which indicates the oscillatory case, oscillatory behavior. So what we want to do is to decompose this total response or density, temperature or something or other, uh, into uh, Fourier components. Now, the way we formally, but we won't do this now, uh, do this is by taking the Fourier and perhaps Laplace transform forms, plural. Uh, we'll explain why we mean that. We'll take Fourier in space and Laplace in time because we have infinite, we have in mind infinite homogeneous media, so we'll take Fourier transforms. We have in mind time starting at some particular time and going forward, so we'll probably take Laplace transforms. But for the moment, uh, we don't want to do that. That's the formal procedure. We just want to get a flavor for how things are going here. So what we'll say is, well, we'll just imagine that we have sort of one wave, and we'll imagine, say, that the density, which maybe I should just mark over here as n of x and t, just x, not underlined, that is to say, not vector for the moment. And this we'll just take as some average value times e to the i k x minus i omega t. Now, the first thing is that we'll be used to, or it'll be customary, to um, be thinking in, say, one dimension. But often we'll need to go to three dimensions. So, you know, x, y, z, not just single dimension. And so this will be n bar. And then the only thing that happens in three dimensions, time doesn't change, but the kx becomes k dot x. Okay, and then minus i omega t. And then, of course, what I mean by uh, k dot x, um, if we want to uh, spell that out, is that that k dot x is equal to then uh, k sub x, x for the x component plus k sub y, y plus k sub z, z. So, you know, it's got three components. Sometimes we'll deal with one-dimensional situations where we only need k, where we mean kx, and other times we'll have kx, ky, and kz. Okay, the implicit assumption when I write this, uh, this way, is usually that this constant, n bar, uh, we'll assume that that is in fact real. Uh, and the implicit assumption when one writes down that n of x and t is some constant times e to the i k dot x minus i omega t is that 
we're really only interested in physical quantities, which cannot be imaginary, electric fields, density, stuff like that. You can't have imaginary density, really. And so the implicit presumption is that it's only the real part of n which is important. But we use the e to the i k dot x minus i omega t just to, to keep track of things. So if I then take the real part of the density, that will be just n bar cosine uh, k x minus omega t. And so this is the uh, physical quantity. namely the real part of the density. Now, there's all sorts of little conventions you get into in any particular field. And one of the conventions in plasma physics is that we use e to the i, e to the minus i omega t. So uh, this is a sort of note. We're assuming that n is uh, n bar e to the i kx minus i omega t, which is then like e to the minus i omega t. And in particular, uh, the reason why I write this down is to say it's not, okay, um, e to the i omega t, although some old papers in plasma physics you'll find occasionally uh, use e to the plus i omega t just to keep us on our toes. Um, or, and it's also not e to the j omega t, which is a common electrical engineering way of writing it, sometimes in various, paper, uh, various articles and so forth. And if you're used to this, the easy way to do it is just say that J is defined equal to minus I, okay? And that'll save you most of the time. Uh, you sometimes have to be a little bit careful about some stuff. So the moral to this story is we will always have modes which are presumed to have a time, time dependence like E to the minus I omega T. Now, if I have this, um, well, this uh, oscillating quantity here, what I might like to know is that if it's some wave, uh, so here's sort of n as a function of time, and since it's oscillating around, I take only the real part, um, you know, it's, it's going to sort of oscillate and so forth, and it's also going to oscillate in space, okay? Um, so the time scale here is, of course, uh, one, 2 pi over omega, and the, time, and the length scale here is, of course, 2 pi over k. But pragmatically, this n, uh, if I wanted to stay at the same phase of this wave at all times, I'd have to be moving at some, you know, I'd have to be moving around. So let's imagine that we say, um, so this is... Uh, point of constant phase. And so the idea is we have n is equal to n bar, and I'm going to call it e to the i little phi. That's my little phi, where phi is the phase factor that sits up here, this k, kx minus omega t. And if I wanted to be at the point of constant phase, what that would say is that this phi is equal to a constant. Now to see where I would have to move to stay on that constant phase, I would like to set d phi dt equals zero. And that is then just equal to k dx dt minus omega dt dt, which is however one. So this tells me that the wave phase velocity, which I'll call V sub phi, I can just work this out, is equal to omega over k. Uh, and this is the, the phase velocity. It's the point, if I follow the constant uh, phase point, it's, the way, it's where I sit at a point of constant phase. Um, now, I called it a velocity. Okay. Uh, here, I only had a one-dimensional system. What would happen if I had a more than one-dimensional system? Well, it turns out that then I would have, uh, this would be k dot x, and I take the derivative with respect to time, and I get dx dt for a velocity dotted into k. 
And what we would end up finding out is that the phase velocity um, in three-dimensional space is just omega over k um, times k vector hat. So that is to say, in the direction of the k vector, which is the direction of wave propagation. Or some people write this as omega over k squared uh, times k vector. Okay. Now, um, can this wave phase velocity be greater than the velocity of light? How about, yeah, there's no problem. The reason is because all it does is represent a, a train of, of pulses. And in some sense, this train of pulses all by itself communicates no information. Therefore, I'm not communicating anything greater than the speed of light. So we're going to turn out to have in plasmas some, uh, some phase velocities of waves greater than the velocity of light, some smaller than the velocity of light. And uh, we'll be perfectly happy with that. But something that transmits information is effectively the group velocity. And we'd sort of better make sure that that is less than the velocity of light or else we've done something wrong. So this is OK um, because we're not carrying information. That is to say, if I just turn on a carrier signal, if you think of it, as the whistle in the background, or of a, of a radio wave, if I just turn on the signal and leave it on, I'm not really carrying any information except on-off. And then, uh, and then it's the on-off that carries information. On the other hand, if I modulate it, then I would be carrying information, and I can only carry information along a carrier wave then at the speed of light. So waves it's perfectly hap are perfectly happy to have phase velocities um, greater than the velocity of light. OK, now a few other little things here. Um, one is uh, some, uh, in this particular case, we assumed that, that there was no extra phase factor. That is to say, the density had some phase, uh, or had e to the i k dot x minus i omega t. There might be an additional factor in that if I look at some other quantity, like, say, the electric field. The electric field might have a different phase compared than the density, let's say, be out of phase with it somewhat. So let's a little bit uh, think about that possibility. So um, let's consider an E field with a different phase. Uh, presumably relative to the density, which I just talked about. So what we might imagine is that then in the electric field is equal to some average quantity, let's say. And then we have e to the i kx minus omega t uh, plus some phase factor delta, okay, just some, some shift. Now, what people tend to do when they find this of interest is they lump the two of those together, and they make it equal to E complex. Okay, um, And where E complex is then uh, E bar, E to the I delta, which is then E vector bar times cosine delta, of course, plus I sine delta. So that's uh, perfectly happy as well. Now, one might notice that if I wanted to know what this phase factor delta was in terms of the complex uh, electric field components, then you know I could take sine over cosine, and that's just the tangent. And so uh, we could have that the phase I could write as the arc or inverse tangent of the imaginary part of E vector complex over the real part of E vector complex with the E to the I k dot x minus I omega t factor um, uh, canceling out. So the moral to this story, sort of, or simple comment, is that we can have any quantity for, let's say, any quantity. <laughs> 
call it G vector. Uh, I'm going to write it as a tilde, meaning we're going to have some uh, linearized quantities. Uh, I'm going to write it a little bit differently than Chen does, but anyway, I use a hat to tell me that I've converted from real space to Fourier space, basically, e to the i, uh, k dot x minus i omega t. And the problem is, uh, well, let me write out specifically what I mean by this, namely that g vector is a function of x and t, whereas this g hat might be a function if you did a full Fourier Laplace transform of k and omega. And then I have my phase factor e to the i k dot x minus omega t. But pragmatically, um, well, uh, sorry, and this factor g hat is, uh, is in general complex. You know, it could have this phase factor or not. Uh, a little bit depends. You typically choose the phase factor to be uh, no phase factor, say, with respect to the potential or the density, and then everything else uh, that oscillates or something like that, you, um, you refer to that particular phase factor. Um, the reason why I write this little hat is to tell me that I've converted from a real space varying quantity to a quantity which is a coefficient of the Fourier, uh, e to the i k dot x minus i omega t, is the Fourier coefficient of that particular component is the idea. Now, um, when, we, when we're going to do in a little while linearized analysis, okay, so we're going to say any quantity we have, density, potential, electric field, is going to vary like e to the i k dot x minus i omega t. And then we linearize, and we're going to find everything proportional to e to the i k dot x minus i omega t. And then we'll be able to cancel out that factor. And what we are then calculating are, you know, the properties of the coefficients that come in here, what those coefficients are doing. And we're presuming implicitly in that that it is appropriate to talk about uh, this phase factor e to the i k dot x minus i omega t. Okay, the next thing we want to go on, so this is just some brief comments on the phase, fa uh, phase velocity and, and these complex phase coefficients. The next thing we want to talk about is the group velocity, which is the speed at, or velocity at which we can um, transmit uh, information. So, so it's group velocity for information transfer. And this one had better be less than the velocity of light, or else you worry. Okay, how do you produce modulation of a carrier wave? Well, effectively what you do is you take two waves and beat them together. And the beat wave is then what actually carries the information, it turns out. Two carrier waves, if you wish, but anyway. So what we want to do is beat two waves together. There are other ways of doing this, but this is the development Chen does, so we'll follow it. So what we imagine is that we have one wave that he has E is equal to E naught. Uh, uh, well, and the, the waves are going to have K plus delta K, delta K is some small dependence difference, and omega um, plus delta omega. And then there's going to be another one, uh, which has uh, got um, K minus delta K, and omega minus delta omega. So our first wave will then have, whoops, sorry, E naught times the cosine of kx minus omega t, but that's k plus delta k times x minus omega plus delta omega times t. And then the second wave has the same form except that it's cosine k minus delta k x minus omega minus delta omega t. Now, if I add these two together, I get the total wave, E1 plus E2. What's that look like? Well, 
I'm sure that everybody remembers this formula, so I shouldn't even write it down, you know. But there's this little, nice little, uh, you know, uh, what do you call it, uh, trigonometric identity that the cosine of A plus B plus uh, the cosine of A minus B uh, is equal to 2 times the cosine of A times the cosine of B. Okay? So if I put E1 plus E2 together, what I get, just you know, using this trigonometric identity on the sum of those two waves, is then 2 E0 times the cosine of one part times the cosine of the other. And so the first one I'll put is the cosine of delta K times X minus delta omega times T. And then we have the cosine of KX minus omega T. Um, now, what do these two terms represent? Well, this last term is effectively the term we talked about before. It's just the, the, the real part of e to the i k dot x minus i omega t. So this is what we would call the carrier wave. And with what phase velocity does it move? Well, it moves with a phase velocity of um, omega over k. Okay. What does this other term represent? Well, this is our modulation or our beat wave. And this moves with a group velocity, which is equal to delta omega over delta k. Same, same logic as we used before. If I want to stay at a constant phase uh, in here, I have to take dx dt, uh, uh, you know, the derivative of this phase, set it equal to 0, solve it for dx dt. dx dt is then uh, delta omega over delta k, so d omega dk. And um, so the net result of this is that we then find that the, the, the modulation or the information carrying part travels at the group velocity rate And what does that look like, by the way, if I, um, you know, um, convert it into three-dimensional form? Well, it turns out it's the partial of omega with respect to k vector. So that is our group velocity. Um, and in one dimension, uh, it, on it only goes to this, um, uh, in 1D, it just goes to uh, derivative of omega with respect to k. So that is our uh, group velocity. How about this one? Does it have to be better, less than the velocity of light? Well, this is carrying information. The beating of the waves is carrying information. The modulation is carrying information. So this had better be less than the velocity of light. Now, in plasma physics, most plasma physics is done non-relativistically. There is some work done relativistically. Uh, and for that non-relativistic type calculations, you go, so what you have to do is you go through the calculation and you calculate the group velocity of some wave. You're looking at some wave in the plasma. And then in the last step, what you do is you say, well, gee, I ought to check that this is all self-consistent. And so you go and you calculate the group velocity and you make sure that the group velocity turned out to be smaller than the velocity of light. Okay. Uh, because otherwise you've either made a mistake or you've pushed uh, the theory beyond uh, where you should have pushed it. Now, um, Chen has a relatively rudimentary discussion of, of waves and more particularly a sort of electrostatic way of looking at things. Um, Bittencourt in Chapter 14 has a re very nice discussion of things like wave phase velocity, polarization, group velocity, an energy flow by the pointing vector, you know, moving in the k direction. E cross h is in the k direction for vacuum waves, and or waves in uh, electromagnetic waves in vacuum. So uh, I would recommend you read that as a, as a kind of background material for more more details on on waves just in in vacuum. Um, we will of course be treating waves in a plasma, uh, which will be somewhat more complicated. Okay, so the, with this sort of introduction about what waves are up, what we're up to in waves,
The next subject we want to go into is electron plasma oscillations, which is our uh, kind of the most fundamental um, oscillation in a plasma. So let's just call this uh, plasma oscillations. Now, the, uh, uh, what we really have in mind here is that we're physically starting out with a plasma that's more or less infinite, homogeneous, well distributed, and, and you know everything's constant, and I got an equal number of ions, electrons every place, and now somehow I just pluck the electrons, or I let the electrons move, and they move a lot faster than ions, so they just start moving thermally. And the basic idea is every time one electron moves off, it creates a potential, a positive potential, wherever it was, which tries to pull it back. Okay? And so the idea is that it, it moves, and then it gets pulled back by a potential. But the problem is every time it gets pulled back by the potential, it runs over to the other, it, it overshoots. It doesn't have very much inertia. And so it shoots off to the other side. So roughly speaking, electrons are going to move of the order of a Debye length or longer, just jiggling back and forth. But we want to describe that now not as a single particle process, but as a fluid process. There's a whole group of electrons doing this, and there's some density of them. And so we're going to imagine that we have an infinite homogeneous plasma and that we take the density of electrons in this one little unit volume and we just up or, or down it or you know, increase it or decrease it. And then we watch what happens. And that response is going to turn out to be plasma oscillations. Now, so since we're interested uh, you know, in such a problem, we're, we always like to make a lot of assumptions to make it as simple a problem as you can the first time through. So the assumptions we'd like are basically that there will be no magnetic field. That would just force us to deal with V cross V, gyro motion, stuff like that. We don't have to face, we don't want to have to face up to that. But I might say what we're going to do is also applicable to one dimension, one dimensional uh, free flow along a uniform magnetic field. Uh, it's essentially the same problem. The second comment is that we're going to have no thermal motion. That's not actually true. I'm going to kind of keep it, but this is sort of the, you know, T goes to zero. Uh, but we'll keep in some parts. Sometimes. And I'll be explicit about where we keep it and don't keep it. Now, as I said, the electrons, you know, they're real lightweight guys, and they jiggle around real fast, you know, and, and they respond to electric fields because the electric field force operates equally on ions and electrons, but the electrons have far less mass, hence less inertia. So they really respond to the electric field. The ions are pretty sluggish. So it's uh, convenient then to just say that, well, the ions are just there, and they're just a sort of uniform which means homogeneous, uh, plus charge background. And if the electrons would just sit still and have some average density, then it'd have to be equal to that same density, or else we wouldn't have charge neutrality. So this is going to be an equal and opposite to the average electron uh, charge density. Fourth major assumption. Uh, we don't want to have to deal with the edge of the plasma where we actually lose electrons. We'll come back to that later, talk about so-called sheath effects. But for the moment, we're going to say the plasma is infinite uh, in extent. Now, no plasma is ever totally infinite, right? You know. So what do I really mean by that criterion? Well, you remember Debye shielding distance was kind of my criterion for whether or not I have a collective medium. So what I really mean by that is that the scale length of the plasma is in fact 100,000 Debye lengths, something like that. Uh, since we're talking about waves, however, uh, what we really mean is that L is going to be much greater than 1 over K is itself going to be much greater than the Debye length. Uh, 
So I want to make sure that the waves actually don't feel the geometry is, is kind of what this approximation says. So it's many, many Debye lengths that will allow that to fit in. Let's just put it that way. Now, also for a uh, simplified form, the easiest uh, form, you know, the simplest sort of thing, uh, we're just going to have a one-dimensional situation. So let's make the electrons only move uh, in the x direction. Um, what that means that it is that if we have the gradient, say, of density, um, then that's just going to be a unit vector in the x direction, dn dx. Uh, I mean, everything's only going to be okay dependent upon the x dimension. So e is equal to uh, e uh, x hat, uh, and since that's equal to minus grad phi uh, by oh, I'm, ha ha, we forgot a rather critical assumption here. Or actually, it's implicit, and you've got to watch out for this. When I said no B field, I actually meant in equilibrium and in oscillations, okay? So maybe we would like to say, uh, in addition, uh, uh, electrostatics here. That's implicit in that comment of no, no B field. And if that's the case, then I can take E is equal to minus grad phi, and then this is minus uh, x hat uh, d phi dx, or partial actually, but anyway. Partial because phi is going to be dependent upon time nonetheless. Um, so basically what I'm trying to get at is that we're only going to have x dependences. So only x dependences, spatial dependences plus, actually I should say, T time dependences. So the idea then, or what we want to do now is, with these assumptions, you remember we discovered or discussed that the description that we'd like to use for a plasma is in fact some fluid equations. And so what I want to do now is I want to set up those fluid equations, discuss, you know, what, what approximations, what all these approximations allow me to simplify those equations to, and then I'll get a series of equations, and then we'll see what we can do about solving them. So, and we only need them since the ions are going to be immobile and average and all that sort of stuff, uh, not interesting. We only need um, these equations for the electrons. So let's look at the electron fluid equations. And what are those? Well, first we have the density conservation equation. And what that is is, of course, dn. Now, since I'm dealing with electrons, I'll just make a, a subscript E for the electron density. dn e dt plus del dot N E V E is equal to zero. But now we said that, in fact, we're only going to have X dependences of things, right? So that being the case, uh, the del dot just becomes a derivative with respect to X. And I still have to leave it here actually a partial derivative because that partial derivative with respect to T is done at constant spatial position, but this partial with respect to x is done at constant time, right? So it's not a total derivative. And my NEVx gets replaced by NE, I'm sorry, NEV vector by just VEx. So my density conservation equation then simplifies to dNe by dt plus partial with respect to x of N E V E X is equal to zero. So that's my density conservation equation. Um, next, I'd like my momentum conservation equation. Um, now, that is M E N E. -E 
dv by dt, but or d velocity by dt. But remember, the d by dt is in fact a um, a total convective derivative, partial plus flow velocity dot gradient. So it's the partial direct time derivative plus the fact that I'm flowing. So, you know, just so we can kind of keep track of things, we'll write it out. So it's dve by dt. Um, it's supposed to be a subscript e. And then plus ve dot gradient ve. Nice tensor quantity there. And this has then got to be equal to nqe is the Lorentz force. But for electrons, you know, QE is equal to minus E. So this will be minus E N sub E electric field. And then I'll have the V cross B Lorentz force, but we said no magnetic field, so we don't have to worry about that. And then finally, we'll have minus TE grad N E. And this we could have written as the gradient of the electron pressure. Okay, but my pressure is T, um, T grad, uh, NT, NETE. Now, one little subtlety which we're going to come back to later uh, is that I'm going to stick in the good old factor gamma here to say that, in fact, in this case, we're going to consider uh, three dimensions and we're going to end up saying that gamma is equal to 3 later in the calculation. Uh, we sometimes do that. Let's put it, I'm sorry, gamma is equal to 1, a one-dimensional situation. And so we'll do gamma equals, well, gamma is uh, uh, 2 plus n over whatever it is. Anyway, gamma is going to turn out to be 3. Uh, so the idea for a one-dimensional situation, so the comment is we'll just throw this in for now. And it's an arbitrary constant that we don't need to worry about. Yeah? Aren't you assuming no thermal motion? Well, I was going to. <laughs> but we're, uh, I, this is where I'm going to keep this, this uh, term and kind of uh, consider it an extra nuisance and put it off, you know. But I'll keep it all the time. And you're right, if I wanted no thermal motion, truthfully, my assumption there, it's at this point that I should take TE equals zero. But we're gonna, I'm going to want that in the end, so it's better if I just kind of keep it as we go along. But yes, good thing to point out. Right there is where I've taken account of a thermal motion. And if the plasma didn't have that temperature, then, well, I uh, wouldn't have that term. Okay, or didn't have thermal motion. Now, uh, what do we do about some of this? Well, again, I'd like to simplify. And so I'd like to take only the x component of this equation, right? So I take x, x hat dot this equation. And so that's going to give me m e n e. And then my first term here is then d v e x by d t. What do I do about that, v dot del? Well, the v e dot del would just become v e x d by d x. And then that v vector will be v e x. So I've got VEX derivative of VEX with respect to X. Now, we also really wanted, you remember, to take the electric field and say that it's, in fact, an electrostatic electric field. So it's minus the gradient of phi. And two minuses make a, a plus here. So the net result is that we can write this as n sub e, e times partial of phi with respect to x for the x component. And then finally, we have minus gamma t sub e dn e by dx. OK, and that turns out to be the momentum balance we'd like to acknowledge that we're going to have to deal with in a moment. But what do we need to complete this besides a right-handed bracket there? Uh, what we need to complete this is we need some way of calculating the potential. <coughs> 
Okay. Because uh, we're going to have, here's an equation for the density. It says if you knew the velocity, you could calculate the density. Here's an equation for the velocity that says you could calculate the velocity in terms of the density if you just knew the potential. How do we know the potential? Well, in contrast, as Chan even says it as in his book, uh, we will use, okay, Gauss's law. Uh, but what he really means by that is take all the terms in the, in the equation seriously. Uh, anyway, so what we need to do now is to look at Maxwell's equations and to see how we're going to get the potential out of them for this particular electron plasma oscillation problem. So we got Maxwell's equations. Um, and what are those? Well, let me just write them all down. Curl E is equal to rho over epsilon naught, Gauss's law. Then there's the Faraday induction law. Curl E is equal to minus dB dt. Uh, no magnetic monopoles, del dot B is equal to zero. And finally, Ampere's law, curl of B is equal to mu naught uh, J, running out of space, uh, plus epsilon naught DD, DE, I guess, uh, DT. Doesn't really matter because uh, we said we're going to have no B field, so therefore, uh, that equation is moot. Uh, likewise, no monopoles. This is zero. And, of course, the solution of curl E is equal to zero is just that the electric field is minus the gradient of a potential. So the net result of all this is that uh, our Gauss's law becomes then Poisson's equation. We take E is equal to minus grad phi and stick it in here. And then we just get minus del squared phi is equal to the charge density over epsilon naught. Now, there is a little bit of subtlety, though. What do we do about the charge density? Well, it turns out that for the charge density, what we should have is the charge of the electron times the electron density minus the ion density. Okay. Um, actually, I should be a little bit more specific, and I'm going to allow myself a little bit of free charge as well. So, sorry, uh, oh, <laughs> yes. I usually write it as Ni minus Ne and avoid that problem, but if I write it as Ne minus Ni, yes, I had better put in a minus sign there. Good point, yeah. The <laughs> uh, reason why we do that, well, anyway. Okay, so the net result uh, is that Poisson, and, and by the way, Poisson's equation, the del squared, again, we're only interested in, in one dimension. So therefore, this becomes minus d squared phi by dx squared, and this is equal to, and I'll write it back the other way like I should have written it in the first place, which is ni minus ne. Ah, oh, yeah. And then rho over epsilon naught will give me an over epsilon naught. And then I've got maybe some free charge also over epsilon naught. Okay, so what we've put together then is that we have three equations which we need to solve um, to, you know, self-consistently or something like that in order to determine um, the, solution, the uh, plasma oscillations. So let's summarize those three equations. So um, let's just say plasma oscillation equations. And those equations were density conservation, which we simplified to dNe dt plus uh, d by dx of Ne vEx is equal to zero. Uh, and perhaps I should say that Ni is equal to Ni naught equals a constant. 
I, you know, just didn't bother to write that down, but uh, yeah, that's what we what we knew. Then we had our momentum balance equation, Me, Ne, partial of Vex with respect to T, plus Vex, partial of Vex with respect to T, and this is equal to plus N sub E, e d phi dx, and then minus gamma T E dn dx. Again, this is my finite temperature term, which we maybe will ignore here in a moment, but I'll keep it for a moment. And then finally, we had Poisson's equation, minus d squared d squared phi by dx squared is equal to E over epsilon naught times Ni minus Ne uh, plus rho free over epsilon naught. So that's all I have. And these are the simplest, let me put it this way, uh, if you neglect the temperature here, these are basically the simplest equations you can have for describing in general plasma oscillations. Can I solve them? And what am I trying to solve for? So the question I'll, I'll pose is how do we solve? What do we need to solve for? Well, what we would like to be solving for is the electron density as a function of x and t. Okay, so that's the solution to that equation. The electron flow velocity in the x direction also is a function of x and t. And finally, the uh, potential as a function of x and t. How do I solve those? Well, first comment is not possible in general. I mean, you know, uh, it's no easy way to get a reg regular solution, let's say. Uh, but you can do it by computer. Almost do anything by computer except our 10 to the 19th particles. Uh, but anyway, but it's not easy, and uh, there's no physical interpretation 